CH66, Treasure, 6. Ralph and Travis, they all agreed. Then I'll explain the plan. I explained the plan to the team members. Soon, their eyes widened. Isn't that too dangerous? Travis glanced around at the team members and then stopped speaking. I'm fast on my feet, so I think it's worth a try, but aren't the roles Nocter and Ralph are taking on too dangerous? Whom? There was a moment of silence. No one said a word. It wasn't that they didn't understand. Should we give up? If even one person slips up, we're all done for. No matter how much we desire first place, it's not more valuable than our lives. Just then, Krara. Breaking the silence, Nocter suddenly rose from his seat. As I thought, weighing the odds isn't my style. I'm in. I'm in too. Ralph nodded. If you two, who are most at risk, are okay with it, then of course, I'm in. Travis also nodded. So, the only one left is. Aisha, what do you think? If you don't want to do it, we won't blame you. I looked at Aisha evenly. She met my gaze without flinching. You heard me earlier. What? Theo, I said I trust you. A small, genuine smile spread across her face, a welcome change from her usual forced smile. It's decided then. I dusted off my clothes and stood up. Then let's go catch that thing. Let's go. It's been a while since my blood boiled. To be honest, the spiders we've been fighting so far have been too boring. A true warrior should go for the boss, not the little minions. Nocter said, loosening his body with a big movement. Ralph joined in, warming up in a similar fashion. I'll do my best. I'll keep the attention on me, make sure you guys are safe. Travis glanced at the two towering figures, then copied their movements. We approached the target, a mutant spider twice the size of its regular counterparts. Its exoskeleton was tough, and each of its eight legs was as thick as Nocter's. It's a lot scarier up close, I thought, tension filling my body. But I wasn't afraid. A creature like this is a mere stepping stone on my path to top grades in this deadly academy. While I was mentally preparing myself. Sudden quest, subdue the mutant giant underground spider. Reward, two shop gold coins. A quest window popped up. Sudden quests are unexpected, they don't give any warning. They weren't in the original game. In fact, a mutant underground giant spider wasn't even part of the current timeline in the original game. Well, anyway, it doesn't look like there are any special conditions. I just have to take it down to earn two gold coins from the shop. That's pretty good. They rushed straight at the spider. The spider, having better vision than a normal specimen, quickly noticed the team's approach. Theo darted towards its right side. Travis, the left side is yours. Got it. Immediately, Travis advanced towards the left side. They aimed to distract it until Nocter and Ralph could get underneath its body. Thump, thump, thump. Continuously, Theo jabbed the spider's thick leg with his longsword. Likewise, Travis also jabbed at its thick leg with his spear. In response to the pain, the spider shuddered greatly. It charged towards Theo in a fit of anger. For a creature its size, it moved surprisingly fast. But Theo avoided its charge with minimal movement, focusing only on its first right leg. Mutants heal quickly. If the cut isn't deep enough, the wound heals fast. But small cuts like these can build up, causing temporary harm. Good. Dodging the spider's continuous charges, Theo saw two figures stealthily approaching its rear. As the spider dashed towards Theo. Let's move. Are you ready, Ralph? Of course. Nocter and Ralph slipped under the spider's body. Simultaneously, Theo shouted. Aisha, now's the time. Yes. G-R-R-R-R-R-R. Red mana gathered at the tip of Aisha's arrow. Boom. Her mana-charged arrow smashed the spider's second right leg. Silent screams filled the air. With two right legs injured, the spider faltered. Travis took the chance to jab its first left leg. Losing balance, the creature slumped. GR, growling dash. Lift it up now. It's tough, even with three legs hurt. Nocter and Ralph hoisted the weakened spider and threw it aside. The creature's belly, marked with a large red spot, was fully exposed. At the same time, Aisha's bow flashed. The mana arrow pierced right through the creature's midsection. Its body convulsed violently. Still, it tried to rise again. Nocter lifted his axe. Let's cut off the remaining legs just to be sure. Good idea. Nocter and Ralph, weapons aloft, were about to charge at the spider once more when. Ah, too bad. Size isn't everything. Monsters aren't true warriors. True. It didn't last long. The creature's body vanished, leaving behind only a large, crimson mark. You have cleared the sudden quest. As a reward, you have obtained two shop gold coins. Total reward, two shop gold coins. Phew, that was tough. My blood is still boiling. It's been quite a while since I had to fight like that. I almost died. I didn't think I'd have to use my buffs twice in one day. Nocter and Ralph lay sprawled out on the ground, absolutely spent. You all did an amazing job. Who would have thought we'd take down a monster like that? Even the third and fourth year seniors wouldn't have managed this well. Travis, eyes shining with admiration, held up a large, red mark as he spoke. Ugh, I might have tensed up too much. I'm feeling it now that I've relaxed. I'm wiped out, utterly wiped out. And I didn't even do much, hee <laughs> hee. Travis then joined Nocter and Ralph on the floor. I glanced at Travis. No, the success of our mission is due to everyone performing their roles flawlessly. 
But still, Theo, I can't help but think you could have done it all on your own. You did most of the distracting. I felt like I was useless. Every member is essential, Travis. That's what it means to be a team. Thanks for saying that, Theo. Ever since I started at the academy, that's the first time I've heard something like that. Travis raised his arm to cover his eyes. Hey, hey. Are you crying? Hey, a man doesn't cry over something like that. It's embarrassing. Ralph laughed heartily, patting Travis on the back. Aisha, who was standing next to me, looked down at Ralph. Ralph. You cried too, remember? After you lost to Theo, you cried in the middle of the arena. I can still hear your sobs. Waya, sniffle. Aisha mimicked wiping tears from under her eyes. With a sour look, Ralph hastily sat up. I didn't cry that much. And that was then, this is, different. Well. If you say so, I suppose. Anyway, you all worked hard. Ralph sulked, lying back down again. The team clearly needed a rest. A break is crucial during missions. Keeping both mind and body fit increases the success rate of the mission. This is a good time to retrieve the magic cartridge. It's not too far from here. If I hurry, I should be able to make a round trip in 30 minutes. Everyone, take a breather for a moment. With those words, I turned my back to them. Where are you going? Just going to see how the other teams are faring and scout around. I can come with you. Nocter attempted to sit up. Ralph followed suit, attempting to sit up as well. No, just rest. As Aisha said, there are no other monsters around, so I can manage on my own. Ah, uh, alright. Be careful then. Once again, Nocter and Ralph lay down flat. Sure. After one last look at my teammates, I headed straight towards the treasure. Aisha, meanwhile, shot me a subtly curious glance. She's probably planning to follow me. Well, it doesn't matter. It had no form anyway. Soon, I stood before the resting place of the magic cartridge. A peculiar stone tower reached into the sky before me. The magic cartridge, a relic that allows one to wield magic up to the third circle. At last, it was within my grasp. A considerable asset to my arsenal. When boosted with the amplification orb, even third circle spells could become potent magic. Boom. I took a deep breath, clearing my mind. The process was straightforward. Just as when I acquired natural power, all I needed to do was input a specific pattern. The original game Karen Xena Chronicles typically maintained a grave and somber tone. Perhaps to lighten the mood, it frequently incorporates details in unexpected places and elements inspired by popular phrases and amp memes. The pattern I was about to input fell into the latter category. Boom. Exhaling deeply, I began entering the sequence. Tap tap tap, tap tap tap. Three taps on the left, three taps on the right. I alternated between the left and right sides of the stone tower, tapping thrice on each side. Then, the stone tower crumbled with a thunderous rumble. Chapter ends. A glow pulsed from the crumbled stone tower. Formless. The magic cartridge flickered like a flame. It's just as I saw in the game. I reached for the glow. Silence. The light flowed into me as if it had been waiting all along. Ugh. The left side of my body began to burn, engulfed in intense heat. The sensation was painful. You have cleared the hidden quest. You have earned two shop gold coins as a reward. Acquire hidden piece. Repeatable. You have acquired a hidden piece. You have received four shop gold coins as a reward. Total reward. Six shop gold coins. However, the sight of the quest completion window eased my pain instantly. Six shop gold coins. Adding the two coins I obtained from subjugating the mutant spider earlier, I had earned eight coins within half a day. At this rate, I would soon be able to purchase a valuable trait. Moreover, I obtained magic cartridge. Curiously, I touched my left side, the exact spot where the magic cartridge had embedded itself. The same spot Neek had it in the game. If magic cartridge had a physical form, it simply seeped into me. All I could do was accept it. Neek, always the pushover, would have gone ahead and said, Instructor I found something strange in the dungeon did I do well? He he he, and handed it over. Hoo hoo, I stifled a chuckle. I had invested half a day for an artifact along with eight shop gold coins. The future has changed, and at this rate, it's a whole new game. Just as I was relishing in this small triumph, I felt a gaze. My enhanced, observer's eye, scanned the shadowy corners. A suspicious figure lurked behind a distant wall. It was most likely Aisha. I darted towards the wall. As I thought, it was indeed Aisha. Her wide eyes trembled with surprise. I, I was just I was told to scout. Aisha averted her gaze, unable to meet my eyes. It's not a big deal. You're just doing your job. With those words, I moved to leave. In the end, only I knew, magic cartridge, existed. There were no changes of being found out. Th thank you. But I, um, what is it? How did you, cause the stone tower to crumble? How much did you see? I, uh, I saw, uh, I won't tolerate any lies. I locked eyes with Aisha. Just how much had she seen? Hopefully not the three taps left, three taps right. A wave of embarrassment surged within me. I saw, you did some strange dance in front of the stone tower. You were hopping around, and even punched the tower. Oh, oh. It was really impressive. This was beyond embarrassing. 
Quickly, I boosted, dignity of the twisted noble, with, amplification orb, but um, how did you do it? It didn't seem like you were hitting it with much force. Casually, I licked my lips. I discovered it from old documents at home. An excuse plausible enough to move past this awkward moment. Aisha likely couldn't access the Waldert family's records yet. She wouldn't have access to the family's secrets until her third year at the academy. Even with the accelerated timeline, it wouldn't be now. I see. After a brief pause, Aisha nodded. It seems like she bought it. I moved faster. Let's return quickly, then. Yes. After our break, we quickly resumed our search for the marker. Soon, a strangely conspicuous rock that didn't fit its surroundings appeared. It must be near here, right? Let's move that odd rock. Noctur and Ralph lifted the rock. Beneath it lay numerous worn-out coins, heaped in a pile. Is this it? But it's too obvious, it makes me suspicious. Each teammate had their thoughts. Noctur looked at me. Theo, is this it? Yes. It's exactly the same as in the original game. Those tarnished coins served as markers that the instructors had placed beforehand for this practical evaluation. They had kept it simple, considering the first-year student's skill level. One could compare it to the difference between a boot camp and the actual battlefield. In a real dungeon, artifacts are not as easily discovered as these markers. However, while the markers are easily found, they have unexpected traps attached to them. Travis picked up one of the coins. But what happens if we take them all? Right. Can we just take them all? Would we be the only winners? Indeed, it does seem strange. The team glanced at me. I vehemently shook my head. The professors and instructors are not fools. If they deliberately left such a large amount, there must be a catch. Let's take only one. That's the trap. In the original game, taking more than one coin resulted in a poor evaluation in the character assessment. Each coin is equipped with a magical device, so they'd know instantly. My teammates nodded. I see. Is it over now? I miss daylight. No, of course not. The guardian was still waiting. So we picked up one coin and prepared to surface. But the guardian didn't appear. In the original game, a flesh golem always appeared. The mutated underground giant spider must be the reason. In fact, the mutant was even stronger than the guardian. Anyway, it seems like our team is in first place. Let's head to the surface. I led the way up the stairs. There's a lot to do. I had to devise a plan to outweigh turning white. First, I should show the evidence to Rock. Even though he is a bald, eccentric bachelor in his late 30s living alone, he was reliable and would be a big help. Our team surfaced. Near the magic dungeon's entrance stood Rock, arms folded. You've come out much earlier than expected. You're in first place. At Rock's words, the team erupted in cheer. Cool, oh. I knew the hard work would pay off, ha <laughs> ha. Huh, it's the first time I've ranked first since enrolling. It's all thanks to you guys. Everyone worked so hard. But I, showing no elation, approached Rock. Were there any distress calls from other teams? None. I have something important to tell you. I narrowed my eyes. Rock immediately sensed something was off. Let's change locations. So, our team and Rock relocated to a nearby cabin. Creek. Rock pushed open the cabin door. Welcome, senior professor. Seeing Rock, the seated instructors instantly stood. Everyone. Please excuse us for a moment. Understood. In unison, the instructors complied, exiting the cabin. Rock seated himself on an old wooden chair with a dignified posture. What is it that you want to talk about? First, there's something I'd like you to see. I sat across from Rock and gave Travis a look. Quickly catching on, Travis unwrapped the evidence, the red marker, hidden in his cloak beneath the table. Boom. Despite his nonchalant response, Rock's eyes were alert. He then looked at me, urging me to proceed. I remained silent, studying him. Rock turned to the students. I'm sorry, but could you all step out for a moment? Understood. At Rock's request, all students, but I exited the cabin. He is indeed a man who understands. Assured by this, I began recounting the events within the magic dungeon. Aisha stepped outside the cabin. She had contemplated eavesdropping on the conversation between Theo and Rock inside, but quickly dismissed the idea. Being curious here could strangle me. What if she got caught? She no longer wanted to do things she might regret. But having a private conversation with the meticulous senior professor, Rock, he must be gradually earning his trust. It was also Rock who publicly announced the capture of the culprit from the previous monster subjugation incident. As Aisha strolled towards a quieter spot, she found herself deep in thought. She couldn't figure out Theo's intentions. Even though he had forgiven them, for him to credit the capture to those six who had accused him baselessly, purely on suspicion. There must certainly be some trick, but she absolutely couldn't guess it. Just act as you normally would. Don't be so nervous. She recollected his words from earlier, just before entering the magic dungeon today. Was there a hidden meaning behind those words? She truly didn't know. Phew. Unconsciously, she let out a sigh. He's on a different level. Chapter ends. CH 68, Trust, 1. Thud, thud. Aisha, who had retreated to a secluded spot, sank to the ground. I was nothing more than a goblin in a cave. Though she had never shown it outwardly, she had believed herself to be smarter and more level-headed than others. And she had proven it. Even in the hero department, where only the continent's top students gathered, she ranked among the best. She excelled in theory as well. But she had been mistaken. 
She was a fool, a foolishly smart person. She had failed to understand Theo's goals until now. She couldn't understand the larger picture he was drawing. Did he even see me as a threat? Today, Theo had shown once more, not with physical power, but with his intellect. He had effortlessly won over Ralph, who had been hostile towards him. And, I discovered it from old documents at home. A clear warning, don't overstep the line. But it was strange. Normally, hearing such words would have infuriated her, but she felt no anger. Had she unknowingly acknowledged him? Even when I knelt before. Theo had only spoken about the time she foolishly accused him, he never mentioned the countless behind-the-scenes manipulation she had orchestrated to take control of the Waldrick family. He must have known, but why? She couldn't find an answer. Her mind spun. Taking deep breaths, she tried to soothe her feverish mind. I'll gauge his reaction and decide from there. Aisha hung her head. She still didn't understand. But one thing seemed certain. Theo didn't hate her. She remembered a time from their childhood when Theo had raged at his tutors and maids, refusing to study, and had even torn at their hair. Considering those memories, while he might not like her, he certainly didn't seem to hate her. After all, he had forgiven her, at least on the surface. Even when she had pretended to be scared in the underground magic dungeon and had clung to him, he hadn't pushed her away. That would have been impossible if he truly disliked her. Instead, try to be helpful to me. I believe that with hard work, even negative emotions can be transformed into positive ones. I prefer action over a hundred words. Those were the words he had said not long ago. Right. He couldn't have said such things without meaning. She couldn't change the past, but as for the future, she would try her best. To be of help to him. I will immediately form an investigation team. That should wrap up our discussion. You've worked hard, professor. With that, I was about to exit the cabin when, before you leave, would you tell me, just between us, what trait you received? I won't tell a soul. Rock looked at me and gave a faint smile. As I said earlier, it's a secret. I gave a faint smile back. Just like before, whenever Rock cracks a joke, he smiles like that. That bald old man really likes his jokes. At least they're not dad jokes. All right then, I understand. It seems I've kept you here too long. Go rest. Thank you. Please take care as well, professor. I gave a slight bow. There's no reason for me to disclose my abilities. Rock won't try any more than this. He's the type who carefully weighs gains and losses. As long as I am not against him. Creek. I stepped out of the cabin. The sun was already setting. The other teams had already finished and exited the dungeon. Just as I was thinking. Theo. Sienna, who was nearby, dashed towards me and wrapped me in a tight hug as soon as she saw me. So, nothing happened during the dungeon. Of course, he he. What do you take me for? Sienna looked up at me, staring intently. Were you waiting for me? He he, I can find you no matter where you are, you know? Bragging about stalking, huh? As soon as I get back to the room, I have to spray the spirit repellent. I'll spray it even if it's the last thing I do. Just then, Theo, Aisha suddenly appeared. Whom, but? She seemed somewhat different than usual. Did something happen? What is it? Do you know that there's a regular meeting for the Tactical Strategy Club today? Ah, right. Thanks. I had forgotten because the break was so long. Aisha gave Sienna a calm look. And Sienna, there are so many people around, so could you please restrain your behavior a little? Ha! Huh? What's wrong with this? Is it wrong to show affection to the person I like? Everyone is looking at us. And, and, if you're the princess of the great forest selves, please act with some dignity. Why does that matter? I'm not a princess right now. With that, Sienna hugged me even tighter. Aisha's red eyes glowed fiercely, acting like a child. Your 150 years of age seems meaningless. What? Detaching from me, Sienna shot Aisha a glare. Damn it. I'm caught in the middle and it's hell. What did I do to deserve this? But Aisha, why touch on her age of all things? That is Sienna's sensitive spot. Really, there's no dignity to be found in you. Theo dislikes people without dignity. Aisha did not back down. Dislike? Sienna, who had fallen silent for a moment, looked at me with an anxious face. Is that true, Theo? What are you talking about? For now, I extended my hand in a placating gesture. Do you dislike people without dignity? I, I do dislike them. Theo would naturally despise them, and his influence on me. Dislike, yes that's the right word. I see. Understood. Sienna bowed her head. Her shoulders trembled slightly. Could she really be crying? I've never seen Sienna cry in the original game. Did I give the wrong answer? I suddenly feel apprehensive. When it comes to getting on someone's bad side, there's no one as scary as Sienna. I have to make amends. As I was bending my head to look at Sienna's face. Hee hee, you're cute. Suddenly, Sienna wrapped her arms around my neck. I felt a soft and overwhelming pressure against my face. I'm suffocating. Let. Let go. I managed to keep my composure and spoke up. What? What are you doing? Aisha rushed over and forcefully separated Sienna and me. Then she glared at Sienna. You, you shameless person. How can you do this so brazenly? Aisha couldn't continue her words. Blushing as red as a beet, she turned her gaze towards me this time. And, and Theo, you too. Why were you just standing there? 
You, as the future head of the esteemed Waldert family, should have pushed her away immediately. If I had done that, I might have really been in trouble. She doesn't understand the fear that comes from experience. One cannot easily shake off such deep-rooted fear. Anyway, let's quickly have dinner and go to the club meeting together. We're running late, so hurry up. Aisha grabbed my wrist. She's fearless, not even slightly scared of Sienna. Is she living life on the edge? Anyway, it hurts. Ease up on your strength, seriously. Being pulled along by Aisha, I turned to look at Sienna. See you tomorrow, Theo. Sienna waved at me with a satisfied smile. After some time passed. Release me now. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. Aisha hastily apologized. Is this the same person who was so confident in front of Sienna? Well, her demeanor does change rather quickly. Why, why? Why are you looking at me like that? What nonsense are you talking about, Aisha? I was simply admiring you. Ad, admire? I'm sorry could you repeat that? I think I misheard. You couldn't possibly have said that. I was admiring you. Your composure in front of the elven princess of the great forest. It was impressive. Aisha turned her head away in silence. After a moment, she spoke up. Next time, when the elven princess acts like that, don't just stand there. What's with that lack of dignity? You're going to be the next head of the Waldirk family. Anyway, let's hurry. Why are you walking so slowly? Isn't it exciting to have a club meeting after such a long time? Not really. Even if you say no, can't you at least pretend to be a little happy? Aisha's energetic voice echoed. Hmm, I can try. In any case, I managed to acquire a magic cartridge and eight gold coins from the shop in just one day. Aisha put in her fair share of effort as well. Wow. I'm thrilled. That's enough. Chapter ends. CH69, Trust, 2. We're running out of time, so let's grab a meal at the school cafeteria. Although I do wish we could celebrate our first place victory at a restaurant. Everyone has plans, so let's save that meal for later. Ugh, fine. Theo and Aisha stepped off the carriage. Where are you two going? Peel, who was near the stop, asked. Theo remained silent. Flustered, Aisha glanced back and forth between Theo and Peel before speaking up. We have a club meeting. I see. Peel didn't say anything further. She cast a quick, intense gaze at the two. Let's get moving, Aisha. You mentioned you're on a tight schedule. Ah, yes, yes. Theo briefly glanced at Peel and briskly walked past her. After dinner, instead of heading to the club meeting, I made my way to the training field of the hero department. I wasn't there for a workout. Hush. I came to take a shower. Couldn't stand feeling dirty. Walking into the training grounds, I thought back to Aisha's words. Oh my, you're more meticulous than me, and I'm a girl. You, the great heir of the Waldirk family. Anyway, I'll wait for you, so hurry up and freshen up. It's not like I enjoy this. Ever since my conversation with Rock in the cabin, I've been uneasy. Huff. The shower was refreshing, relieving some of my stamina. After the shower, I changed into a fresh academy uniform I had packed and spritzed some cologne. Aisha and I arrived at the cafe where today's tactical strategy club meeting was taking place. The spacious area had a simple interior with minimal decorations. I had been here before. The other club members had already gathered. Nice to meet you. We're late. Ah, I see the discussion hasn't kicked off yet. Sorry for holding things up. We can't start without you, Aisha. Andrew refused to share any details, so, Aisha, could you fill us in? Tell us the thrilling tale of how you guys captured the culprit of the magic dungeon incident. Ah, that explains why Andrew had a sour expression on his face. But he hasn't denied anything so far. Not only Andrew, but now the others were trapped in my grasp as well. Finally, the hardships have come to an end, and happiness is just around the corner. I should also enjoy some of the perks. He he. I chuckled inwardly and took a seat. Oh, as I mentioned before, that's a difficult story to share. I apologize, but, it's a secret. Aisha, drenched in sweat, also found her place. The tactical strategy club meeting ended swiftly. Ah, uh, I can't talk about it. If you keep asking, I'll get upset. Yeah, let's not push it. There must be a reason. Aisha and Andrew refrained from discussing the magic dungeon incident, causing the atmosphere to grow cold. Moreover, since Aisha and my team secured first place in the artifact exploration practical evaluation, many club members bombarded us with questions, but I didn't say much. Of course, Aisha followed my lead and remained tight-lipped. We simply attributed our success to luck. If the topic of the stone tower were to come up, it could become problematic. A nobleman's son from a prominent family dancing a ludicrous shamanic dance in front of the stone tower? Ugh, just the thought of it makes me dizzy. All right, let's conclude today's meeting here. I'll inform each of you individually about the venue for our next gathering. You all did a great job. The words of the future club president, Aisha. Ah, uh, everyone put in a lot of effort. But since it's been a while since we've all been together, why don't we chat a bit more, not just about tactics? One of the club members suggested. Hee hee, I've been itching to have a conversation. I agree too. The majority of the club members were in agreement. There's no need for me to interrupt. I have something to take care of, so I'll head out first. Great job, everyone. I stood up from my seat, 
Aisha's eyes widened. Uh, where are you going? I'm going to the training ground. Today, I had been observing Nocter, Ralph, and Travis's techniques. Their weapons were different from mine, but their moves were worth attempting to integrate into my own skill set. I'll come with you. I want to learn more about swords. I think I'm rather lacking when it comes to close combat. I've had the intention to learn, but today I've firmly decided. Is, is that all right? Aisha looked up at me, her eyes filled with anticipation. Of course, it's all right. With Aisha's, weapon master, trait, she'll learn quickly even without a strong foundation. While a bow suits her more than a sword, proficiency with a sword could be a game changer, providing an edge in close combat encounters. All right. It will also benefit me. Training with Aisha will be more efficient than facing off against magic dolls, and she'll need to keep improving in the future. Becoming stronger won't hurt. But there won't be any breaks, and it'll be challenging. Ah, let's just go already. You underestimate me too much, don't you? I have two master level traits. Aisha grinned widely and was about to follow me when. Aisha, do you have a moment? Andrew intercepted her. Andrew felt a pang in his heart. Aisha, merely looking at her caused his chest to tighten. Theo, Aisha. They had arrived at the meeting together, albeit late, and throughout the discussion, Aisha's attention was solely on Theo. Even when Theo's words lacked warmth, she would laugh continuously, lightly patting his shoulder as if he had said something incredibly funny. Of course, Theo was a man deserving of such attention. Setting aside the halo effect of being a Waldirk, he was capable and generous. That only made the pain sharper. The feeling of defeat, man to man. Aisha, do you have a moment? Ha, huh? hmm, I'll head to the training field first. Clink, clink. Theo departed from the cafe. Ah, Aisha's expression soured. It was the first time he had seen her wear such a face. Let's step outside for a moment. Aisha and Andrew exited the cafe. The chilly October wind whipped against them. What's the matter? I'm short on time, so make it quick. With a gaze colder than the wind, Aisha stared at Andrew. Ah, Andrew felt his heart shatter into pieces. Nevertheless, he had to ask. Aisha, what is? Theo to you? Andrew held on to hope. He hoped it was nothing significant. Better yet, don't answer at all. He is someone I will be with, for the rest of my life. However, Aisha's response was the complete opposite of Andrew's hopes. With a soulless expression, Andrew aimlessly roamed around the hero department. Aisha took my heart. It felt as if he could never truly love another person. Aisha had torn his heart apart. Someone to spend a life with. Aisha's expression was far too serious. There was never any chance at all. Ah, uh, aha. Uh -huh. Andrew wiped away his tears with the back of his hand as he wandered. His broken heart had nowhere to go. Then, a hot dog shop caught Andrew's attention. He didn't usually indulge in them since they were essentially fatty with little nutritional value, but, today, he felt like having something to eat. Andrew entered the hot dog shop. Welcome. A female employee greeted him. With his head bowed, Andrew spoke. One hot dog? No sugar. My heart isn't that sweet. Mm, one hot dog. But it won't taste as good without the sugar. The employee remarked, offering Andrew a smile. Andrew found himself captivated. If there was an angel that could make one forget all worldly woes, wouldn't it be the owner of that smile? Here's your hot dog as per your request, there's no sugar. But I'd recommend having it with sugar. I've tried everything on the menu. The employee smiled once again. Ah, uh, only now did Andrew have the chance to study her face. Compared to Aisha, she had plain features. Yet there was a tender warmth in her eyes that offered him solace. Thump! Andrew fumbled, dropping his hot dog. Oh, you seem to be having a tough time. The employee spoke with a gentle smile. Just wait a moment, I'll make you a new one. And she handed Andrew another hot dog. If you've been crying until your eyes are red, it must be something hard. I don't know what it is, but cheer up. Oh, and this one's on me, from my part-time pay. But let's keep it between us. It'll be our little secret. Andrew hurriedly opened his mouth. May I, ask for your name? He stuttered nervously, his words stumbling out. The employee still wore a warm smile. I'm Sally, a first year in the night department. I? I'm also a first year. Andrew from the hero department. Ah, I see you're wearing the hero department uniform. All right, Andrew. Make sure to visit often. Stay strong. With that, she smiled radiantly. Her comforting smile washed away all his concerns and melancholy in a blink. I, thank you. Sally, his heart rekindled with a newfound flame. Chapter ends. After the tactical strategy club meeting, I trained with Aisha. Um, am I holding the sword correctly? If you put it like that, who would know? Please explain in detail. Surprisingly, Aisha was a novice when it came to swordsmanship. In the original game, characters with the Yi Weapon Master trait could quickly adapt to new weapons. Something felt off. But then again, many things had changed from the original game. So, I guided her as if I were teaching a beginner, just like Irene had done for me. I held Aisha's wrist and waist and instructed her on the proper form. Hmm, I think I kind of understand. But it's difficult. Will you teach me again next time? Ah, uh, no. Why are you making such a scary face? Why not? I'm also a member of the Waldrick family, aren't I? 
Isn't it natural for the next head to take care of his subordinates? Seeing her enthusiasm to learn, I decided to teach her again next time. Still, with the V Weapon Master trait, her skills should improve rapidly with just a little guidance. At least that's what I hoped. While lost in these thoughts, the carriage arrived at the dormitory. I headed straight to my room. Nice to see you, Theo, Zhang Wei suddenly appeared near the dormitory building. She was dressed entirely in black, resembling a stealthy cat. Um. I didn't even notice she was there. Where did she come from? Anyway, it was about time. Last week, I had asked Zhang Wei to investigate the turning white group that had infiltrated the school, using prophecy as bait. Let's go. I know a quiet place, Zhang Wei responded. I hope it's not far. Follow me, she said and disappeared, moving so fast that she would have been out of sight if you blinked. Ah. I really didn't feel like running. After the artifact exploration and the training session afterwards, I was already tired. But still, I ran behind her. About 20 minutes of sprinting later, we finally stopped at a remote location, quite a distance from the dorm. It was an isolated place with untouched grass and trees, devoid of general stores or restaurants, so secluded that no one would notice if a person were to disappear. I approached Zhang Wuhi slowly. Did you find the rats I asked you to investigate? Almost all, Zhang Wuhi replied, avoiding my gaze slightly. Annoyed, I clicked my tongue. Almost all? I specifically asked you to find out everything. But, tell me what you know. I've written it down here, said Zhang Wei, pulling out a small piece of paper from her pocket. The paper was crammed full of tiny handwriting. Ah, my eyes hurt. It's also getting dark with the sun setting. At times like this, magic like, light, or traits like, sharp vision, would have been useful. I need to add, light, when I start loading magic into, magic cartridge. I squinted and read through the information on the paper. To be honest, I was surprised. Really, it's just like she said. Zhang Wei had managed to uncover almost everything, except for the identity of the leader. The future's been accelerated, as expected. I read through the information once more. Most of the characters who appeared toward the end of the first year and during the break in the original game were already making their appearances. Given Zhang Wei's current abilities, it would have been difficult for her to acquire this much information in such a short period of time. As expected, she's desperate. This is good. No, this is more than good, it's impressive. Maybe she could become a valuable ally. While I hid my admiration and mulled over my thoughts, she broke the silence. Are you really a prophet? Zhang Wuhi asked. Her voice was as flat as usual, but I could sense it, the worry that was veiled in her words. I looked at her calmly. If I were to say yes, would you believe me? Average people tend to exaggerate and boast about their meager abilities. I don't need to do that. I know exactly what she needs, and I surpass most prophets. With a smug smile, I confidently pointed out, you couldn't identify the most crucial target, the leader. I searched the entire school, but I couldn't find them. That's on me, Zhang Wuhi confessed, her head dropping slightly. Her lowered head was a clear sign of desperation. In the original game, Zhang Wuhi was known to hate any actions that suggested submission, like bowing her head. Hmm, I think I understand why she couldn't find the leader. The leader isn't within the academy, they're hiding in the northern forest, technically part of the academy grounds, but not a place one would typically consider part of the school. I put on a scornful look and locked eyes with Zhang Wuhi. So why show up? Surely, you're aware that the leader you couldn't find is more important than those you have found. I'm sorry. I failed, Zhang Wuhi admitted, her head bowed again. If it were anyone else, they might have dropped to their knees. She must be feeling a kind of humiliation she's never experienced before. But she has no other choice, I am the only one who can help her. Your ambition is quite high despite your limitations. Truly, you are driven by greed, I stated calmly. And I left it at that. Anxiety flickered in Zhang Wuhi's expressionless eyes. Silently, she bit her lip, her small fist tightly clenched. Thump, thump, thump. Blood seeped from her clenched palm, where her nails had dug in. That's unsettling. Did I push her too hard? But to handle Zhang Wei, it's necessary to keep her on her toes. I gazed down at her, maintaining my aloof demeanor, and murmured, very well. Zhang Wei's eyes widened in surprise. If I were to give you another chance, could you handle it? I asked. Certainly, Zhang Wei replied, her eyes glowing fiercely as she met my gaze. I feel a bit like the villain here. However, I need to ensure her commitment to this cause. Zhang Wei and I must keep turning white in check within the academy. Today's artifact exploration was a prime example of this. Turning White is the largest evil organization in this story. We cannot underestimate them. We need to monitor and handle them cautiously. I have also entrusted some of this responsibility to Rock. But Zhang Wuhi is capable of moving solo and inconspicuously. It's probable that the same individuals behind the evaluation are the ones detailed in her report. Before Turning White can incite a major incident, we need to swiftly handle any infiltrators within the academy. This will improve my prospects of graduating and protect the academy at the same time. I will provide you with more information tomorrow. After tomorrow's lectures, look for me. We may need to use force, so come prepared. I hurried back to the dormitory. As expected, Amy emerged upon hearing my footsteps. You have returned, young master? Yes. You appear quite exhausted, young master. If you don't mind, may I prepare some nourishing food for stamina recovery, young master? Yes, thank you. 
With that, I retreated into my room and immediately took a shower. Even though I had already bathed after training with Aisha. Thanks to Zhang Wei, I was once again drenched in sweat. Damn it. Once after waking up. Once after the evaluation. Once after training. And now, once after coming home. It's absurd to shower four times a day. They say excessive bathing isn't good for the body. Swoosh. Under the warm flow of water, I studied my reflection in the mirror. My muscles were undeniably more defined than before. My body structure and physique surpassed those of most models. No one could lay claim to a more aesthetically pleasing body than mine. However, marked on my left side were the symbols of the magic cartridge. They were magical characters, though their meaning eluded me. It really looks like a tattoo. As long as I retained the magic cartridge, this tattoo-like mark would remain on my body. Damn it, I can't let anyone see this. I didn't want to invite unnecessary suspicion. The child of a noble family getting a tattoo in their student days? Oh boy, if it ever gets out. Just thinking about the scandal makes me feel dizzy. After showering and meticulously inspecting my surroundings, a notification appeared. Hidden quest cleared. Reward, 10 shop silver coins. Objective, increase stats without relying on items. Repeatable, total reward, 10 shop silver coins. At last, my stamina has reached 8. Chapter ends. CH 71 to 71 trust, 4. It's finally happened, my stamina has increased. All the hard work, especially recently, has paid off. And today's spoils aren't over. I acquired 8 gold coins from the shop and the artifact, magic cartridge. It's a record-breaking payday. If every day was like today, maybe I could match the likes of Neek and Peel before graduation. But that's never going to happen. To be honest, days like this wouldn't come even once a month. The higher the expectations, the greater the disappointment. It's a painful truth I've come to realize, both in the modern world and this realm. I quickly suppressed my joy and organized what I need to do. First and foremost, I will save the gold coins from the shop. I won't spend them. My main goal is to acquire expert level traits. The price of expert level traits in the shop is 20 gold coins. Even though I got 8 gold coins today, it still doesn't reach 20. Besides, I've been consistently ranking among the top in practical evaluations. There's no need to rush. Unless I'm cornered, spending on lower level traits is a bad idea. Next, I need to figure out how to make the most of the artifact, Magic Cartridge. Magic Cartridge is an artifact that enables me to use magic up to the third circle without consuming mana or casting spells. It allows someone like me, who lacks mana, to utilize magic. But right now, it's empty. Because no magic has been stored inside. I need to find someone capable of storing the magic I want. I want debuff magic. There are many resilient creatures like orcs, lizardmen, and beastmen who can withstand third or fourth circle offensive magic. But with debuff magic, even if it's just third or fourth circle, it can be very effective when used right. I also plan to keep the fact that I have, magic cartridge, a secret. So it's difficult to ask Andrew. Even if I have something on Andrew, he'd also know my weaknesses if he knew the magic I was planning to get. Syria is definitely the best choice. Syria. She ranks first in the magic department, an eighth circle mage, and is the daughter of the Black Tower Master. A named character who politely turns down many male students with a smile. Of course, I know what Syria's likes. Maybe she could be a good ally after Jang Wei. Lastly, I need to check on turning white. Whom? It's too soon to tell Rock everything I know about turning white. He seems to like me, but I need to be sure I can trust him. How should I approach this? I'm trying to come up with a method that inflicts maximum damage with minimal losses. But my brain is tired, I can't come up with a good strategy. I stood up and paced around the room. Then, I noticed the spirit repellent I had left on the shelf. Ah, right. I should use this in advance. It's not that I don't like Sienna, but I don't want her following me around all the time. So, while I was spraying the spirit repellent, knock, knock, knock. Someone knocked on the door. It must be Amy. She mentioned earlier that she would bring food that helps with stamina recovery. Yes, I should eat first, then get back to thinking. Come in. Understood, young master. Amy entered my room with food. Out of habit, I glanced at Amy's status. There was no difference from usual. Name, Amy Watson, gender, female age, 17 race, human affiliation, Walder Kaus slash equilibrium strength, 7 stamina, 7. There was a clue that might solve my problem. Affiliation, Walder Kaus slash equilibrium. Yes, right here. The organization that provided the spirit repellent in my hand. A group that, for unknown reasons, assigned Amy to me, Theo. A mysterious organization that even wages wars against countries. Yes, that's equilibrium. If I play this right, I might be able to fix things without a hitch. Hoo hoo. I couldn't help but laugh. Amy looked surprised, and her cheeks went a little red. Excuse me, young master. Is there something on my face? Why are you looking at me like that? The next day, Tuesday, all the lectures had ended. It was time to go catch the boss hiding in the northern forest. Of course, it wasn't the actual boss of Turning White. It was the leader of those who'd snuck into the academy. The real boss of Turning White was a beast that even the top-ranked active hero team couldn't handle. Naturally, it was more evil and powerful than Francis, who held a low-ranking position. But unlike before, when we went to arrest Francis, I had to act with more secrecy. I needed to avoid attracting attention as much as possible. If people found out I was leading the operation, Turning White would immediately suspect me. I didn't want to become their target. 
I quickly packed my stuff and just as I was about to leave the classroom, Theo, can you teach me swordsmanship again today? After our practice yesterday, I tried practicing on my own in my room, but I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, hee <laughs> hee. Suddenly, Aisha approached me, her eyes gleaming with enthusiasm. No, I'm going to take a break from training today because I'm tired. Practice on your own. Why? Yesterday, you trained even after the evaluation and the club meeting. Is it possible? What? That you don't you want to teach me? We're not strangers, I'm a member of the Waldrick family. Aisha pouted. No, it's not that. I'm just a little mentally drained. I lied nonchalantly. Well, it's not entirely untrue either. Those turning white troublemakers would be a headache in the future. They needed to be dealt with immediately. Is. Is there something bothering you? Aisha looked at me with concern. Of course, I have problems. Every day is a struggle. Sigh. Yes. I'm good at listening if you want to talk. Maybe I could even help. No, it's something a hero has to overcome on his own. I see. It's something I can't really help with. Aisha hung her head. Now she's making me out to be the bad guy. If Aisha behaves this way, let alone others, it's going to be a nuisance. As the academy's idol, she has too many eyes on her. I can't afford any negative gossip. No, Aisha, you're a great talent. You are helpful in many ways. Really? I didn't explain myself well. What I meant was, I can handle it right now on my own. I'll ask for your help next time when I need it. In fact, I'll soon need Aisha's help. Really? Yes, tomorrow I'll assess your swordsmanship. You're very talented, so don't get discouraged if it's not going well now. Just keep pushing yourself. With Aisha's weapon master trait, if she doesn't give up and keeps trying, she'll reach a high level. After saying that, I left the classroom. Rather than getting in the carriage to the northern forest, I went straight to Jang Wuhi's room. This was part of the plan I thought up. Secrecy was crucial in this mission. That's why I chose only a few exceptional members. Theo, myself, Jang Wuhi, Nocter, Sienna, and Amy. A team of five. I excluded the orc companions. While they'd definitely keep a secret if I asked them to, the risk of being found out is something else. There's a good chance they might inadvertently give something away. That's why Nocter and Sienna took the carriage as soon as the lecture was over, and Jang Wuhi and I plan to take the next one. The carriage will be here soon. Are you ready? Yeah. I've packed everything. Jang Wuhi showed me her bag. Inside the bag, a smoothly curved dagger caught my eye. She's even bringing that along. Before becoming a third-year student, you're prohibited from bringing artifacts and items from outside into the academy. If you're caught, the punishment is severe. Indeed, choosing Jang Wuhi as a partner was the right decision. Let's go, then. And so, Jang Wuhi and I boarded the carriage bound for the northern forest. Upon arriving, we got off and walked for approximately 10 minutes toward the northern forest. Hey, Theo. That's the friend who's skilled with a dagger. Theo, you. How could you bring such an unpleasant person after doing such a thing? You've arrived, young master. Nocter, Sienna, and Amy greeted us from afar. Chapter ends. CH 72 Trust, 5. I observed Nocter, Sienna, and Amy from afar, standing near the base of a large tree. The northern forest, vast and wild, was a key location in the original game. I told them to wait there once they got here. With Sienna here, we can wrap this up fast. Tap tap. I gently tapped Jang Wuhi's shoulder and nodded. It was my silent way of saying, don't call me a prophet. I had already warned her during our carriage ride, but, it's best to steer clear of needless confusion. Sienna, Nocter, and Amy. All three were dependable, but they didn't need to know everything. In this world, the title of prophet held immense power. Those who could see glimpses of the future were few, less than ten in the whole continent. Zhang Wuhi glanced at me and nodded in understanding. As I headed towards the group who had arrived ahead of time. What's up, Theo? Why were you two exchanging looks like that? Sienna, who had rushed over, crossed her arms at me. I wasn't exchanging looks with her. No, you can't trick me. Listen, don't do anything reckless. Don't spray that strange medicine again. If you do, I won't let it go. Sienna frowned at me. But despite her stern look, her voice sounded more playful than upset. I have my own life too. And? Sienna gazed at me, her face puzzled. Ah, so sure of herself, I was momentarily lost for words. And? She says, people who like each other shouldn't have secrets, right? That's one-sided. Isn't it? So you see it too. Sienna interpreted my words differently. Liking each other, isn't that a one-sided thing? And I can't communicate with spirits like you. I can't even see their shapes. Sienna giggled in amusement. Hee hee, do you want to see the spirits? No, forget it. How? The question lingered on my lips, but I bit it back. If I bring it up now, she's the type who would drag me off to the Great Forest claiming it's to teach me how to communicate with spirits. Living in the Great Forest would eventually allow me to sense and interact with spirits, thanks to the clean air and water. But that would take around a hundred years. By then, I wouldn't be in this world anymore. Well, we can't do anything about that. Anyway, try not to cause trouble, okay? I can't promise what I'll do if you do dash. Sienna clutched my arm tightly. Without a word, I looked away. Hee <laughs> hee. Sienna took my silence as agreement and let out a chuckle. Really our Theo is so cute. 
He knows he's about to be scolded, but he still tries to resist shyly. Sienna kept talking by my side. It wasn't a shy resistance. This annoying woman. It's a strategic step back, setting the stage for a bigger leap in the future. I've made my decision. While Sienna has been of great help to me, I can't let her keep pushing me around. Having her constantly watching me would limit many things, personal life aside. I plan to get it later, but I might need it sooner. I need to speed up acquiring another hidden piece. This hidden piece is not a weapon or a piece of equipment, it's a kind of divine beast. Divine beast. A natural foe to spirits. With it, I can certainly escape Sienna's watch. Plus, it has many useful abilities. However, it's situated quite far from the academy, and the round trip would take at least a week. That's why I plan to get it during the upcoming holiday. But now, plans have changed. I'll have to ask Rock to shift the location of the next practical evaluation to that place. Changing academy events diverges from the original game. The likelihood of facing unexpected issues increases. But stopping Sienna's spirit-based spying is the priority. And since the story has already changed, more changes won't matter as much. I will just give my best in every moment. I remember the big frame on the wall of the hero department's training ground with the words, overcome. Surpass. Somewhere along the way, I feel like I've truly become a hero. I wonder if Theo's spirit is affecting me. Even though Theo's character and abilities were seen as below average, he genuinely wanted to be a hero. Sigh, such is my fate. Nice to meet you, I'm Noctur. Hmm, what was your name again? Jang Wahi, right? Yes. He he he, the name of a strong person is hard to forget. Noctur laughed and extended his hand to Jang Wahi. Jang Wahi shook his large hand, which looked like a pot lid. Theo, I don't like her. Sienna clung to Theo's arm once again, shooting a glare at Jang Wahi. On the other hand, Amy looked at Jang Wahi calmly. Amy had learned to hide her feelings because she'd been dealing with Theo, a troublemaker, since their childhood. Whom? Her aura felt familiar, though faint. The slight aura of an assassin. Surely, during that first mission with the young master, it was the same woman who had been watching them at that time. Such an aura is uncommon. A petite figure, standing around 150 centimeters tall. Moreover, her physique matched the one she had seen that day. Now, they were on the same team. Amy moved towards Jang Wuhi and extended her hand. I'm Amy, serving Master Theo. It's a pleasure to meet you, Ms. Jang Wuhi. Yeah, pleasure's mine. With her customary indifferent expression, Jang Wuhi accepted Amy's handshake. He has an assassin by his side. Is he planning something? Jang Wuhi already knew. Amy was also an assassin, much like herself. But she was still unaware that Amy was part of Equilibrium. Today's mission is to detain the infiltrator from turning white, who occupies a leadership role within the academy. I began the briefing without hesitation. If you head north from here, you'll reach our target's hideout. If we can't find the target along the way, secure the hideout first. Just like before, we're not allowed to kill the target, right? Nocturne questioned. Not necessarily. While it's preferable to capture the target alive, we'll react accordingly to unexpected situations. I get it, Theo. I'll do just that. Kakik, if you're this earnest, it means our opponent is tough. It's been a while since I faced a strong adversary, it stirs my blood. Nocturne laughed, grinding his teeth together. Then, I imparted a few minor details to the team members. With a team like this, we should be able to nab her. The leader has the abilities of a seasoned mid-tier hero. Definitely stronger than Francis. But we also have Jang Wuhi and Sienna on our side. Once we take out the leader, dealing with the remaining infiltrators within the academy will be much easier. When taking on a group, it's most effective to target their leader first. It'll be challenging. However, I now wield both strength and knowledge. Now, let's move immediately. Hold on a second. It was Jang Wuhi. What is it? I want to change into something more comfortable. Understood. I'll be back shortly. With that, Jang Wuhi vanished from our sight. Before long, she returned. Her outfit was black, just like the other day. She had dressed in clothes designed for easy movement. I'm back. All right. Let's get started. It felt as if not even 10 seconds had passed. She was exceptionally quick. Her speed was faster than that of a freshly enlisted recruit just entering training camp. Could it be she had been wearing it underneath all this time? After about 20 minutes of walking, the surroundings began to darken. Nocturne shared his observation. The ambience has shifted here. We should tread quietly, correct? Yes. If we spot them, I'll give the signal. We're almost there. According to the original game, their hideout should be around here. Then, Russell. A slight disturbance stirred the bushes opposite us. A minute movement that others might overlook. But I had already activated, observer's eye, before we entered. Nothing could escape my scrutiny. Zhang Wahi. I spoke while keeping my eyes fixed on the gently swaying bushes. Yes. Zhang Wahi had noticed it too. In an instant, she moved toward it. I concentrated ahead, calling out as I dashed forward. Follow closely. He he, got it. All right, let's move. I understand, young master. The team members trailed behind me. All right, let's catch them swiftly and make our way back. Chapter ends. CH 73, Trust, 6. I chased after the rapidly disappearing figures of Jang Wuhi and the leader. They're incredibly fast. If speed were a stat, Jang Wuhi would surely be near the top. Ku, as expected. She's no ordinary person. 
I didn't anticipate her speed. Nocter, running behind me, muttered. I glanced back briefly. Nocter was trailing behind at the very end. Amy and Sienna were directly behind me. Keep following Zhang Wuhi. It won't be easy, but we have to keep running. Understood, young master. Huff, all right. That annoying girl and the person who suddenly fled are too fast. She's at least as skilled as an average elf swordsman. And so, we continued our pursuit of the two. Zhang Wuhi ran with determination. However, the distance to the leader proved difficult to close. Is it my technique? Originally, she planned to stay close and handle the situation swiftly. But the leader was no pushover. It seemed the chase would go on longer than expected. Kaya Hawk. Zhang Wuhi drew a dagger from the pocket tied to her thigh and threw it. The leader, however, drew a short sword from under their clothes and easily swatted the dagger away. Such a natural response. As if they had known the dagger's trajectory from the start. Not an easy opponent. Thinking this, Zhang Wuhi threw daggers one after another, only for the leader to effortlessly block them. It was to be expected. The leader she targeted, Melon, was an assassin. A seasoned one at that. Of course, Zhang Wuhi was currently one of the most skilled individuals on the continent. As a successor of the assassin group Equilibrium, she possessed exceptional talent, but her practical experience paled in comparison to a veteran. After all, Zhang Wuhi was only 14 years old. She was still a kid. Theo spoke up. Sienna, can you trip her up somehow? No, it's difficult to do to someone moving at that speed. Besides, the distance is too great. If I could slow down her movement even a little, I'd give it a try. Whom? Theo quickly thought through his options. There must be a way to temporarily immobilize, Melon. Is there any way to stop her for about 10 seconds? If we could just hold her for 10 seconds, Sienna's spirits could bind Melon. As Theo contemplated possible solutions, Amy spoke to him. Young master, I think we're going in circles. Are you sure? Yes, young master. I may not be much, but I have often been told I have good intuition. I see. A plan started to form in Theo's mind. Theo immediately surveyed his surroundings with his enhanced, observer's eye. Amy was right. It was the same place they had started chasing Melon from. He hadn't noticed earlier due to the dense grass and trees, and his focus on pursuing Zhang Wuhi and Melon, but now it became clear. If it's Melon, she'll keep circling the same area. Melon must know by now. The ones after her were just students. Turning white, would only know the unusual students like Neek and Peel or gifted ones like Andrew, Ralph, and Max. Our team wouldn't be recognized. The only one she might have identified is Zhang Wuhi. If that's the case, Melon would likely aim for a drawn-out chase. After all, there is a considerable difference in stamina stats between children and adults. Amy saw that we were moving in circles, but a typical academy student would keep running around and lose her. Theo summoned his remaining energy and kept close to Zhang Wuhi. Zhang Wuhi, HM. Zhang Wuhi kept her eyes on Melon. Do you trust me? What do you mean? Just as I asked. Do you trust me? Theo's voice, calm yet filled with determination. Zhang Wuhi fell silent for a moment. I trust you. Finally, she whispered softly. Theo looked at Zhang Wuhi calmly and spoke up. Lend me. What? The Moonflower. Zhang Wuhi's eyes widened. And understandably so, as the name of the Moonflower was known to only a select few. Even within equilibrium, the number of people aware of it could be counted on one hand. Truly a prophet. An exceptional one at that. Zhang Wuhi bit her lip, pleased that her intuition had proven correct. All right. Zhang Wuhi tossed the Moonflower, which was tied to her waist, to Theo. Without hesitation, Theo swiftly tucked the Moonflower into his pocket. The Moonflower. A slender, curved dagger that Zhang Wuhi had brought with her to the northern forest. Though it appeared to be a ceremonial dagger on the surface, the Moonflower was far from ordinary. It was an exceedingly rare item throughout the entire continent. Even in the secret armory of the Waldert family, where an assortment of high-end weapons was stored, there were few items of its caliber. The Moonflower was a weapon of legendary status ordinary, rare, hero, legend, myth in ascending order. And Theo was well aware of its hidden, special effects. Zhang Wuhi stole a quick glance at Theo. But, you know, what is it? You have to return it. It's my, of course. For now, continue chasing her. I just caught a glimpse of a new future. Melon slipped away effortlessly. Heh, just what I expected from students. There was one proving to be a nuisance, but that was all a minor inconvenience. The small build and dagger suggested a skill-oriented assassin. Best not to engage in close combat with such types. Throwing daggers from a distance wouldn't pose much of a threat. That must be Zhang Wuhi. Zhang Wuhi, currently ranked fifth among the first-year students in the Elinia Hero Department. With her black hair and tiny stature, she was unmistakable. I need to hang on for around two more hours. Reinforcements were unlikely. Still, she was confident. There were no professors around, no students like Neek and Peel who were beyond comparison with ordinary students. I can't see these kids catching me. They didn't even seem to notice that they were running in circles for the third time. With this in mind, she kept on running. Someone sprang from a large bush nearby. A handsome man with silver hair. But she was an experienced assassin. Despite the surprise, she quickly composed herself. The silver-haired man exuded a fierce aura and was holding a dagger. His stance was more like a swordsman than an assassin. There's no reason to fight at all. Melon passed by the man and was about to sprint away. Then, wish. 
The man charged explosively, swinging his dagger at her thigh. His speed was exceptional. For a moment, he even outpaced Zhang Wuhi. It was difficult to react. Yet she managed to dodge, just barely. The man, however, didn't let up, persistently targeting Melon's thigh. Whoosh! Zhang Wuhi threw her dagger to provide support. Melon deflected it with her short sword, but, ugh, the man's speed was too fast. His dagger grazed her thigh lightly. Melon quickly adjusted her strategy. Originally, she had planned to retreat without engaging in combat in case there were additional reinforcements, but now she decided to eliminate them. Avoiding close combat was a risk-minimizing strategy, but it didn't mean she lacked confidence. No, in a one-on-one, -on -one, I'd bet on myself. Although minor, she was injured. With her current condition, escaping the man's incredible speed seemed implausible. I'm not feeling good. Melon swiftly swung her short sword toward the man's thigh. She expected him to dodge, after which she would aim for his neck as his lower body wobbled. However, swoosh. The man didn't evade but plunged deeply within her reach. Caught off guard. I need to fall back. The dagger the man held wasn't ordinary. And who in their right mind would choose to dive into an attack rather than dodge it? Melon retreated swiftly. The man kept advancing, smiling, his attack unrelenting. There was no defense. The assault was completely one-sided. Hmm. Melon gradually became familiar with the man's dagger skills. Had she been overly tense? His skills with the dagger didn't seem as impressive as she had first thought. Apart from the speed, there wasn't much to note. I must have overestimated him due to his speed. Melon felt a hint of surprise. There was no way she would lose to a mere student. Especially an insignificant one. Then, ha, huh, suddenly, she couldn't move her arms and legs. It was as if they were bound by sturdy ropes. A sudden chilling pain radiated from her stomach. Before her eyes, a faintly glowing flower came into view. Ah, ah. That beautiful sight was the last thing Melon saw. Chapter ends. CH 74, Romeo and Juliet. She's tied up. Jang Wohee, who brought Melon secured with rope, looked at me. Um, good work, I responded, my eyes resting on the unconscious Melon that was now tightly bound. She was thoroughly tied up. Not just her hands and feet, but even her thighs and shoulders were tightly tied with no room for wriggle. She resembled a cocooned insect. Noctur seemed impressed. Ho, oh, even an orc can't move if it's tied up like that. But when will she wake up? It doesn't look like it'll be any time soon. She should remain in this state for at least 10 minutes, I said, looking down at her with indifference. She wasn't unconscious due to external injuries. Assassins are usually accustomed to enduring pain, possessing high tenacity stats. A seasoned veteran like Melon wouldn't faint from just a slight cut on her thigh or a superficial knife wound in the abdomen. The cause of her fainting was the special effect of Moonflower's moon explosion. It induces a random abnormal state in the opponent when after a certain number of attacks or after dealing a certain level of damage. The current abnormal state afflicting Melon is unconsciousness. Of course, this is not the true ability of Moonflower. An effect of this caliber isn't enough to consider it a legendary weapon. Even in the original game, Moonflower is a legendary weapon bordering on the mythical grade. There is another special effect. Moon Murder. An ability that can only be used once a year. After reaching a certain number of attacks or dealing a certain level of damage, it literally destroys the target. Though it's overwhelmingly powerful, I cannot use it. Only individuals with a special bloodline can wield it. In this regard, only Jang Wuhi and her father, the leader of Equilibrium, can use it in the original game. The reason why the leader of Equilibrium earned a reputation as the best assassin on the continent was, to some extent, due to Moonflower. I say to some extent because Jang Wuhi's father is a monster, even without Moonflower. The special effect of Moonflower only matters if it lands on the opponent, if it misses, it's worthless. Even without Moonflower, the man could take on a top-ranking hero team solo. Ah, uh, ugh. Melon woke up. She quickly surveyed her condition, glanced at our team, and mumbled with her head hanging low. Are you going to kill me? Yes, I replied, crossing my arms and looking down at her. There doesn't seem to be any mages around. What trick did you use? That flash of light before my eyes. Too much talking, I interjected, cutting off Melon's words. Melon let a resigned sigh. Sigh. I thought if I were ever caught, it would be by the professors or third or fourth year students from the hero department. Yet I'm caught by five first years. Melon, resigned to her fate, continued to mumble. Despite facing death, she kept talking. Hmm. Just as expected. Just like in the original game, Melon wasn't a high-ranking member of Turning White. Her position was only slightly higher than Francis. It would be better to spare her life. In the original game, Neek accidentally killed her. But things are different now. Most importantly, taking Melon's life now wouldn't be beneficial. On the contrary, it could lead to bigger problems. If Melon was cut off from Turning White, they might send someone stronger to the academy. Melon kept rambling. Sigh. I should have just stuck to what I was doing. I got involved in this thinking I would become rich. We can let you live, I cut her off. What? Melon looked up at me, eyes wide. Of course, it's up to you. Are you interested? Melon's gaze darted back and forth. Answer me. But no matter how much she molded over, the answer would remain the same. Nothing is more important than life. In this situation, there's only one answer. Spare me. I calmly stared at her. 
However, a powerful aura emanating from both my enhanced, twisted noble's dignity, and, natural power, burst forth. Even Jiang Wuhi and Amy, who were on my side, were taken aback. Nulin cried out with a terrified expression. Spare me. Ah, uh, no. Please spare me. I? I don't want to die yet. As I said before, I only joined because they promised a lot of money. I had no ill intentions. Please, please, save me. Who huck? Nulin sobbed violently, writhing in distress. I furrowed my brow. You're noisy. I, I am so, so sorry. Who huck? But, please, please, show mercy. In fact, since being deployed at the academy, I haven't killed anyone. A tear hung from her lower eyelid. Of course, I didn't believe in such tears. What mattered was whether she could be of help to me. Where is your hideout? Ah. Th that. If you, if you walk north for about five minutes, you should see a big tree. Nullen immediately disclosed its location. It was exactly where it was in the original game. I arrived at Nullen's hideout without delay. It was a rundown log cabin, hidden by tall trees and overgrown grass. The reason for coming here was simple. There should be something worth taking. Since Francis had the amplification orb, it was highly likely that Melon possessed something comparable. In the original game, she met an accidental death by falling off a steep cliff, so the item was never revealed. I checked her earlier without success, so it must be here. Boom. I inspected the cramped log cabin carefully with my enhanced observer's eye. Shortly after, I noticed an oddity on the floor. There it is. A small irregularity that would have escaped an ordinary observer's eye. Creak. I gently pried open the wooden cover on the floor. Inside lay two small daggers. I recognized them instantly. Romeo and Juliet. A pair of daggers crafted by a famous dwarf artisan. This game does love its references, even when it comes to naming daggers. Ha! Anyway, these paired daggers are sturdier and sharper than ordinary ones. However, their true value shines when used for throwing. As one can guess from their names, these daggers do not like to be separated. So, a magic has been cast on them, allowing them to return to each other. Of course, you need to charge it with magic power exactly like, magic cartridge. So, it was here. I pocketed Romeo and Juliet. A quite useful item. Though it's a hero-grade item, it can be handier than most legend-grade items, depending on how it's used. Perfect for exploiting an enemy's weak point. An unexpected dagger throw could catch an opponent off guard. Sure, for others, mastering throwing might be a challenge, but I have the observer's eye. Around me, there is Jiang Wei, Amy, and a child who possess excellent throwing skills. By observing and practicing their skills, I can apply them in combat in no time. It's a shame I can only use these when no one's watching. Bringing external items or artifacts is only permitted from the third year onwards. The amplification orb I frequently use is small and less likely to be found, but Romeo and Juliet aren't as easy to hide. Yet, they're too valuable to leave behind. Either way, I've hit the jackpot. Creak. With a bounce in my step, I emerged from the hideout and reunited with my team. What happened? Nellan lay curled up at my feet. Oh, Theo's here? After you left, she kept babbling about offering us a treasure if we untied her. So, I made sure she couldn't talk. Nocter grinned proudly. Nellan lay unconscious, drool trickling from her mouth. There were no visible injuries. She probably received a solid orc beating. I see. Let's go back. Jiang Wei, tightly tie her behind the tree. Understood. So, we securely bound Melon and boarded a carriage back to the academy. I need to meet Rock. I have to persuade Melon so that Turning White believes nothing happened, but we can't keep her bound like this. Chapter ends. CH75 only wanna be with you, one. Thump. Thump. Our carriage bumped along in silence, only our team inside. Well, today is Tuesday. It's strange to have people around after 8 p.m. on a weekday. This isn't Korea, after all. I was worn out after using overload for just over 10 seconds. I rubbed my tired eyes, struggling against sleep as I scribbled down the essential information for Rock. Just enough information that it wouldn't be a problem even if he knew. Speaking of which, we had a lecture tomorrow, but we pushed ourselves quite hard. However, apart from obtaining the pair of daggers named Romeo and Juliet, there was another major harvest. Nullen had revealed everything. Her underlings were behind the artifact exploration practical evaluation, with her right-hand man playing a crucial role in setting it up. I kept writing down information. Once Rock saw this, he would deal with the rest of Melon's group. The most crucial thing, as expected, is. The most critical thing was to negotiate changing the evaluation location to somewhere closer to the Divine Beast hidden piece. It was a long trip even with the carriage, taking one night and two days. It wouldn't be easy, but it was necessary. Who? I sighed with relief as I finished writing the report for Bald Man. The tension in my body began to dissipate. I was exhausted. Of course, in the past, I would have collapsed by now. With my stamina stat increased by one, I managed to endure until now. But I knew I would likely suffer from muscle pain tomorrow. A potion of stamina recovery would have been nice. I need to get that divine beast soon. A divine beast not only hunted spirits but also helped recover stamina. Once I had about 10 stamina and a divine beast partner, I should be able to shake off this level of exhaustion with a good night's sleep. Anyway, I was feeling extremely sleepy. Just, let me close my eyes for a bit. Hee hee. Theo, you're so adorable. 
Sienna gently caressed Theo's shiny hair. Unbeknownst to her, he had dozed off, his head resting on her shoulder. SSSSHH, SSSHH. The sound of his steady breath filled her ears. With a wide smile on her face, Sienna carefully lifted Theo's head and placed it on her lap. Ah, the knee pillow, a crucial part of being true lovers. He he he. She felt like she had become Leary, the heroine and invaluable aide in the Rostos Chronicles, who guided the protagonist Rostos to become the greatest hero on the continent. Theo is not very good at expressing himself. Sienna playfully pinched Theo's white cheek. Despite his occasional small rebellions, she felt satisfied knowing that he relied on her when he was tired. He, who rarely shows vulnerability, is now asleep with his head on her lap. He had entrusted his defenseless body to her. Just like Rostos, it was evident that Theo depended on her and trusted her. Miss Sienna, please give him some space. I don't want to. And what do you mean by give him space? Theo lay down by himself, didn't he? The young master simply leaned on your shoulder, Miss Sienna, and you're the one who forced him there, right? Ah, uh, no. He might not have said it, but I think Theo secretly wanted this. Look, he's sleeping so peacefully. You wouldn't call this being forced, right? I've been with the young master for many years, and I can tell you, he doesn't look comfortable. I've been there when he's been unwell, I would know. Amy reached toward Theo, but Sienna swatted her hand away. No, I told you it's not like that. And it doesn't matter how long you've known him. I can tell. Look at his face. He's definitely having a pleasant dream, do you truly believe that? He he, of course. Shall we ask Theo when he wakes up? All right. But I'll take care of him for now. It's my duty as his servant. Amy reached for Theo again. Again, Sienna swatted Amy's hand away. No, I told you it's fine why are you so clueless? You're usually so perceptive, why don't you get it this time? Ah, as Sienna and Amy bickered, Theo woke up. I felt a soft touch on my head. It felt like my usual pillow. How strange. Regardless, it was time to wake up. I opened my eyes slowly. But, ah. Uh, I can't see the ceiling. Instead of the ceiling, my view was filled with two mounds. Two massive mounds blocked my vision. A chill ran down my spine, like a dagger thrust into my chest. Sleepiness was instantly replaced with alertness. Thankfully, my reflexes are quick. I immediately enhanced, twisted Noble's dignity, using the amplification orb. Theo, did you sleep well? Sienna's face came into view. So the soft pillow had been Sienna's thighs. Oh, I was taken by surprise. My instincts had been right. Long live, twisted Noble's dignity. My apologies, Sienna. I murmured, sitting up and looking around the carriage. Sienna and Amy were staring at me, their gazes polar opposites. Sienna's eyes sparkled with laughter, while Amy's were icy and detached. Hee hee, I could do this every day, Sienna teased. Did you sleep well, young master? Amy asked, her tone emotionless. I felt an urge to escape. The others were watching too. Zhang Wei had a surprised expression, and Noctur wore a wicked grin while gritting his teeth. If you have something to say, just say it. No, I was just surprised. Noctur chuckled. You are a true warrior, Theo. Like me, you attract the ladies. It seems true warriors are similar. Theo, you truly are my good friend. Noctur laughed and gave me a thumbs up. Damn it. Dealing with Zhang Wei is one thing, but Noctur. That orc bastard surely takes pleasure in provoking me. Stepping off the carriage, I headed straight for Professor Rock's quarters. Despite the late hour, I knew the workaholic, bald, old bachelor would still be busy. Whom? I glanced at my team members who were following me. You can all head back now. I need to speak with the professor alone. Everyone, you've done well today. You must be tired, so get some rest. Okay, got it. It was fun for the first time in a while. Hee <laughs> hee, same here. See you tomorrow, Theo? Today was fun. Noctur and Sienna nodded, heading off. Amy and Jang Wahi, however, didn't budge. Amy, you should go. This could take some time. No, young master. It's my duty to stay. I'll wait, she stated firmly. I thanked her and asked her to buy a stamina recovery potion from the alchemy shop. She left, leaving Jang Wahi and me alone. You should go too, Jang Wahi. What do you see? She asked, her gaze intent on me. I knew what she was after. You're looking for a childhood friend, right? Yes, she replied, her normally blank expression showing a myriad of emotions, mostly longing and sadness. I can't be sure yet. It might be because it's too deep and intense. I'll tell you when I find something. I assured her, reaching out a hand. I look forward to working with you, I said. Likewise, Theo, Jang Wahi responded, her small hand overlapping with mine. You must be tired, so go on ahead. I'll speak with the professor. After our conversation, Jang Wahi strolled back to the hero department dormitory, her pace slower than usual. Now I can find Hyoyan, her only friend who had mysteriously disappeared. A glimmer of hope ignited within her, the hope of finally locating Wu Hyoyan. She had found a true prophet, not some questionable figure, but someone authentic. However, a question not at her. Why do the others follow Theo so devotedly? It doesn't seem like he's revealed his identity to them. He's kinder than I initially thought. And he radiated a unique charisma that drew people in. 
Lost in thought, Jiang Wei gently stroked Moonfire, the artifact he had returned to her. Chapter ends. CH76 only wanna be with you, too. TL slash editor, schedule, 5 slash week Wednesday through Sunday illustrations, here. I wrapped up discussion with Rock. So, you're saying we should go outside to draw them out of hiding? Yes. Their primary target has always been the first year hero department students. We saw this during monster subjugation and artifact exploration. They're focused on the first years. If we all step outside, the enemies are bound to make a move. It's a perfect opportunity to take them all out. Hmm, I see. I'll give it some thought. For now, Theo, we need to question the leader you've captured. If Rock's considering it, the chances of him agreeing are above 90%. Rock's approach to work is straightforward, much like a bald scalp devoid of a single hair strand. I'll take my leave then. I bid Rock farewell. Be careful. I know it's tough, but keep up the good work. Your efforts will be always be rewarded. While focusing on the report I handed him, Rock responded. Understood. I'll report if anything unusual happens. Creek. I left Rock's room. I've shared all the information. The majority of the rats should be dealt with by the end of this week. If word gets out that the hero department first years are heading outside for practical evaluations, they'll undoubtedly react. But without their leader, they'll be disorganized. And that's the moment we strike, hitting them all at once. As I walked out of the faculty building, sorting out my thoughts. You've worked hard, young master. Here's the stamina recovery potion you asked for. Amy, waiting nearby, approached and handed me the potion. Thank you. I quickly opened the potion. Stamina recovery potion, grade, ordinary, consumption slightly enhances stamina recovery. However, the effect may vary by individual. View details. Given the item details, I don't expect much. A placebo effect is all I can hope for. I thought back to the potion of stamina recover that Sienna gave me before. I could really use a few more of those. Maybe I should consider a trip to the Great Forest during vacation? I downed the stamina recovery potion in one gulp. Let's go back. Understood, young master. I retreated to my room and pulled out Romeo and Amp, Juliet, from my bag. Its design was a mix of glittering gems and gold. The piece appeared to be the masterwork of a skilled dwarf craftsman. However, it stood out excessively. I should to wrap it in a bandage. I encased the sheath in a bandage and then drew the blade. Shing. The blade emerged with a sharp sound, a subtle chill emanating from its flawless surface. Indeed, hero class items were on a completely different level from ordinary practice daggers. Being a small dagger made it easier to hide. Hmm. Assuming a stance, I swung the dagger around. The art of the dagger was different from that of the long sword. Both the weight and length varied. I should analyze the dagger techniques of Jiang Wuhi or a child when I can. Without a foundation, it feels awkward. It was to the extent that I couldn't use it in actual combat. However, throwing was another story. I've seen the throwing techniques of Ishild and Jiang Wuhi before. I should try it in a training area. It'd be stupid to leave marks here in my room. Ah, and I had yet to test the most crucial aspect. I placed Juliet under the bed and grasped Romeo in my hand. I then summoned it to my side. Just as I expected, it works. There was no noise or spectacle. As though it had been there from the start, Juliet returned to my hand. Effectively, mini teleportation, teleport. Hero class items truly stood out in numerous ways. In this original game, teleportation was considered high-level magic, of the eighth circle. Its practitioners were few and far between. You could count on one hand the number of magicians capable of teleporting people across the entire continent. Wonderful. A smile naturally crept onto my face. Afterwards, I cleaned up and fell asleep immediately, hoping the stamina recovery potion would do its magic. The next day, Wednesday, the effect of the stamina recovery potion was nil. Ugh. My body protested with aching muscles. With my frail constitution, I barely managed to rise from the bed. I wanted to stay in bed, but it was a weekday. Luckily, I wasn't completely incapacitated. I took my time with the shower and dressed up. Ah, it's heavy. The uniform, not even weighing 2 kilograms in total, felt heavy. I slid, Romeo and Amp, Juliet, into my pocket and headed out to catch the carriage. As usual, Irene climbed aboard the carriage to school. Automatically, her gaze drifted towards the back seat, diagonally to the right. Irene's eyes widened in surprise. The person she had been searching for was there. Absent on Monday and Tuesday, he finally showed up. What, you? Irene briskly took the seat next to him. Good to see you. Theo responded nonchalantly, which seemed to work her. Have you been sleeping in lately? Haven't seen you around. As a hero, you should maintain a regular schedule. Irene reproached him, giving Theo a friendly jab on the shoulder. Theo let out an inward yell. Ah, that stings. Under normal circumstances, it wouldn't hurt, but his current state of muscle soreness amplified the sensation. The spreading ache caused Theo to grimace. Irene looked taken aback. W-H, what? Are you hurt? Well, it looked serious. Irene's eyes widened in concern. W-H, what? With just a tap. Barely touched you. I'm not feeling well. I've been pushing myself too hard lately. Ah, uh, I see. It's muscle soreness then. Well, it's impressive that you're working out so hard to feel like this. 
My fault. Irene reached out to Theo. She started kneading his biceps and triceps. Is it better? This is a special massage technique passed down in the Aslan family. I learned it when I was young. You also wield a sword, so your sore spots should be similar. It should help. Irene looked at Theo with an expectant gaze. Stop. Theo waved her off. The massage felt good, of course, but, within the carriage, it was hard not to notice everyone's eyes. Twisted noble's dignity, activated, and a prickling sensation began to emerge. What? You don't like it? I'm sorry. It's my first time doing it for someone else. Irene's spirits seemed to dim. No, the massage itself was great. With that, Theo moved closer to Irene, and he whispered in her ear. There are too many eyes on us, Irene. Irene's cheeks blushed immediately. For a while, she muttered to herself, unable to lift her gaze. Oh, right. Next time, I will do it when, when, when we are alone. Since we agreed to go on a date on Friday. So, I hate to interrupt, Irene. Theo gently tapped Irene's shoulder. Yes, yes. Why, why? Startled, Irene quivered slightly. Don't you need to get off? We're at the night department. Oh. Yes, yes. I, I'll get going now. See you on Friday. Irene awkwardly descended from the carriage. Sparring time. While other students were busy forming pairs and sparring. I was merely pretending to spar, choosing instead to observe Jang Wuhi's dagger techniques. Observing Jang Wuhi's skills is more important. After all, the grades for sparring aren't worth much. It's trivial compared to practical evaluations like the monster subjugation. That's why I had no qualms about using overload yesterday. Most students are aware of this, so no one spars as intensely as I did with Peel that one time. Tarkhan, my sparring partner, looked at me. You seem a bit off today, Theo. It's because of muscle soreness. Ah, the mark of a true warrior. They say what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Muscle soreness is like a lifelong companion. Tarkhan grinned, baring his teeth. Is that so? An orc smile. No matter how often I see it, it's hard to get used to. To be frank, it's intimidating. After my light sparring session with Tarkhan, I took a break and sat on a bench tucked away in a corner. That's when someone approached me. Student Theo. It was Professor Mari who came to speak to me. It's been some time since we last saw each other. As I looked up at her, she wore a warm smile. Do you have a moment? Chapter ends. CH 77, only wanna be with you, 3. Understood, Professor. Rising from my seat, I followed Professor Mari directly to her office. Screech. Contrary to previous visits, the office was remarkably tidy now, devoid of the clutter of various documents and thick books that usually covered the space. Now, all those materials and books were neatly stacked in a corner of the office, almost resembling a small mountain. She must be nearing the end of her research. What did you call me for, Mari Jane? You're always straight to the point. Let's sit down first. Mari replied with a smile. I took a seat on the sofa, the same spot I'd sat in before. Would you care for some tea? I have another lecture following this, so I'd rather forego the tea. I said, maintaining a firm expression. I had a feeling she'd prepare something along the lines of mint tea or a mint chocolate latte. Why would I want that? Even if it were offered free of charge, I wouldn't accept it. I wouldn't drink it even if she offered to pay me. I see. That's disappointing. I just got a special blend from a shop I often go to. Mari seemed slightly disheartened, but she took her seat across from me. Since you're on a tight schedule, let's get right down to business. Thank you. I expressed my sincere gratitude. Firstly, Theo, the research paper you've contributed significantly to is almost complete. It's currently undergoing review. I see. My initial hunch had been right. There weren't many explanations for why her usually cluttered office would suddenly become tidy. Therefore, I plan to present it at the academic seminar of the association this time around. I would appreciate it if you could accompany me. Do I need to? That caught me off guard. I'm just a student, not her assistant or anything. The academic seminar is held at the association's headquarters in the capital. Even by carriage, a round trip would take a full day. Mari gave a knowing smile and replied. Of course there's a reason. Theo, you're the co-author of this research paper. Co-author of the research paper? What did she mean by that? This was a bit overwhelming. Still, it was customary to decline once in such situations. Swiftly activating, twisted noble's dignity, I looked at Mari impassively. There's no need for such formalities. I never intended to be a co-author from the beginning, and I helped you purely out of goodwill. Hee <laughs> hee, of course, I know. I'm aware that you offered your assistance without any ulterior motives. As she spoke, Mari's eyes swept over me. A shiver ran down my spine. Mari approached me and continued. But can I ask you one thing? Did you truly think I would put myself down as the only author? Yes. I answered without hesitation. Naturally, I assumed her name would be the only one on the paper. Mari had always been a character marked by a strong desire for success. Furthermore, coming from a commoner background and facing opposition from numerous noble-born heroes only served to amplify her ambition. Assist Mari with her research, and in doing so, make her own me. That was my original plan. Mari released a brief sigh. Do you really think of me that way? That's somewhat disheartening. After all, 
Despite what you might think, I am an educator. Ah, yes. I replied, mirroring her tone, and then I began to wonder, what's is she trying to do? Mari's research paper is bound to cause quite a stir in the field. She's not a fool. Her title as the youngest professor in the hero department wasn't handed to her out of charity. Yet, she must be aware of how unwise it would be to share authorship. Whom? After a moment of contemplation, I drew a conclusion. She intends to maintain an ongoing collaborative relationship. Only active heroes are allowed to participate in academic seminars. And there's a substantial difference between an active hero and a student. Ignoring the issue of power, there is a huge gap in terms of experience. Naturally, a student attending an academic seminar would become a hot topic. Numerous newspapers will carry my story. Rumors would be impossible to avoid. There couldn't be a better scenario for managing my reputation. This situation didn't happen in the original game. Neek isn't an idiot, but comprehension isn't his strong suit. He's not an eloquent speaker either. However, the future has already changed considerably. If she's willing to be so generous, there's no reason to decline her offer. Finally, I extended my hand towards Mari, who was observing me with a subtle expression. Let's go together. Hee hee, all right. Mari grinned and accepted my hand. Thank you for this opportunity. When is it scheduled? Two weeks from now, on a Saturday. It coincides with midterms week. Understood. I'll clear my schedule. Yes, I'll take care of any necessary arrangements. Oh, and. Mari pulled out a thick stack of papers from her desk drawer and handed them to me. This is the completed paper. Please go through it and let me know if there are any issues, Theo Lynn Waldirk. Will do, Mari Jane. All Wednesday lectures had concluded. Mari's paper was flawless, no review was needed. It was near perfection. Of course, I had provided her with most of the content. While I was packing up with these thoughts in mind. Theo. Do you have any plans today? Suddenly, Aisha, standing beside me, asked. Oh, that's right. I was scheduled to teach her swordsmanship. However, I'm not exactly in the best shape. My muscles are still aching. What, what is it? What's going on again? This is too much. You promised to teach me swordsmanship. Just around this time yesterday, Aisha pouted her lips. No, it's nothing. Let's head to the training ground. Yes. I finished packing and exited the classroom. Let's go together. Aisha followed me, bouncing along like a cheerful bunny. Inside the hero department's training ground, I frowned as I observed Aisha. She hasn't made any progress. Ha! You're learning quite slowly. Hmm. I enjoy it when I'm being taught, you know? But when I practice alone, I don't feel very motivated. That's usually the case. I replied nonchalantly. Aisha looked up at me with a look. So, could you please infuse me with some motivation? Why should I? I retorted bluntly. One should find motivation within oneself. You can awaken someone who is asleep, but not someone pretending to sleep. Aisha hastily replied, B, but. I am part of the Waldirk family. Isn't it natural that as the future head of the family, you take responsibility for your subordinates? Hmm, is that so? Why am I even the future head? It's uncertain if I can even graduate from the hero department with good enough grades. I'm just a visitor from another world who will eventually disappear. Regardless, there are people who can't find motivation on their own and instead need motivation from others. Indeed, many of them exist. Furthermore, Aisha is someone who needs full attention. I suppose I don't have a choice. All right. What do you want me to do? Hmm. Aisha pondered for a moment, then spoke. If I can land even a single hit on you, you have to fulfill one wish of mine. No. I rejected her flatly. I know what she's going to wish for. There's nothing beneficial for me in it. Aisha retorted, sounding a little sullen. Then how about this? If I can hit you even once, you have to teach me swordsmanship individually three times a week. What's the deadline? Hmm. Until graduation. No. Then until the third year. No. Then until the second year. No. Damn. Then just until the end of the first year. Hmm. That sounds reasonable enough. Most students in the third and fourth years are busy venturing out. By that time, I have to become one of the top students. All right. Really? You won't go back on your word? Yes. Aisha looked up at me, her eyes glowing red. The one who will become the head of the mighty Waldirk family. You won't change your mind later, right? You mean it? I said yes. I nodded. With her current skill set, she wouldn't even be able to brush the hem of my clothes, let alone land a blow. Even if my physical condition isn't great, I can easily handle her. Holding a practice longsword, I took my stance. Then come at me first. I'll let you make the initial move. I gestured for Aisha to advance. Well then, let's do some bullying. I lost. More accurately, Aisha landed a blow on me within 28 seconds. Great. Didn't you say you wouldn't go easy on me? No matter what happens in the future, whether it's exam season, or if it's raining or snowing, you're teaching me swordsmanship three times a week, right? An ecstatic Aisha continued to pester me from the side. All right, I replied with a grimace. Just what was that? Even if my physical condition was normal, I wouldn't win without overload. Chapter ends.